So uh, the theme of our meeting today is going to be Mixotroph evolution. So we're talking about the evolutionary origins of Mixotrophy, but also their evolutionary futures. Um, and so uh, we'll start by thinking about the evolutionary trajectories of Mixotrophs into future, future climate changed world. Um, Jessica, do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> do honors? Um, I'm going to, I'm really happy to introduce uh, Dr. Holly Moeller who is a co-organizer of this working group and um, our first speaker today. Uh, Dr. Moeller is an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, her lab broadly works on acquired metabolism in a diverse range of systems from coral reef ecosystems, temperate tree root fungal systems and marine plankton. Um, and so today she'll be um, telling us a little bit about her lab's research on um, evolutionary futures. Take it away, Holly. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Can you see the screen okay? Perfect. All right. So, um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, so, uh, the work I'm presenting today is done by uh, me and a whole host of really spectacular collaborators based at UC Santa Barbara, and one of whom, Susanna Lelix, who's on the call today also, who's co appointed at the University of Southern California. Um, so, as you'll hear in the uh, second talk of this session, um, mixotrophs evolved from an ancestrally, at least eukaryotic mixotrophs evolved from an ancestrally heterotrophic state through the acquisition of photosynthesis through the retention of functional plastids. So, a primary and then secondary and sometimes even tertiary series of endosymbiosis events. And this evolutionary history is really important because it means that mixotrophs are working with two forms of metabolism. And both of these forms of metabolism are sensitive to the temperature of their surrounding environment. And this is particularly important when we think about the fact that the world is getting warmer, the surface ocean is getting warmer, um, thanks to anthropogenic climate change. So generally, when we think of metabolism as depending on temperature, we think of a thermal reaction norm or a thermal performance curve that looks something like this panel here on the right, where the rate of reaction tends to accelerate with temperature, up until some critical threshold, at which point enzymes denature, the organism experiences increased mortality, something happens to cause that rate of metabolism to collapse to zero. Now, where mixotrophs are concerned, the two forms of metabolism that they rely on, photosynthesis and aerobic respiration, which underlies phagotrophy, are both temperature sensitive, but in slightly different ways. And in particular, aerobic respiration tends to accelerate more rapidly with temperature than photosynthesis. Uh, which led Suzanne Vilken, who's also on the call today, um, to make the prediction that mixotrophs would become more heterotrophic at warmer temperatures because this would simply be the more thermodynamically favorable reaction, the more metabolically favorable reaction, I should say. And Suzanne tested this uh, idea in freshwater members of the genus Ochromonas and found that indeed, when grown at warmer temperatures, these mixotrophs became more heterotrophic. Um, but Sarah Princiata, who might also be um, here with us today, uh, uh, similarly did a similar test in another freshwater mixotroph, Denobrian, and found that Denobrian actually maintained high levels of photosynthesis at higher temperatures. So this leads to the conclusion that probably something about the evolutionary history that shapes the phenotypic plasticity or the short-term responses of these mixotrophs to temperature might constrain the extent to which they can shift their uh, rates of metabolism. Now, and this is not a criticism of these two studies, but they were short term studies. So studies of the short term phenotypic plasticity. Yet at the same time, uh, while we need that information fundamentally to make predictions about mixotrophs, we also know that mixotrophs could complicate these responses through evolution. So eukaryotic mixotrophs have small body sizes, fast generation times, large population sizes, the hallmarks of things that we expect to potentially mount a rapid evolutionary response to changing environments. In our group at UCSB, we're interested in understanding how evolution will, will influence the extent to which mixotrophs rely on phototrophy versus heterotrophy in phagotrophy in warmer oceans. And we use a combination of mathematical and experimental approaches to explore this. Uh, so starting on the mathematical end, Logan Gonzalez is a former undergraduate researcher in our group. He has since graduated and is working at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory in Hanover, New Hampshire. And uh, he's actually applying to graduate schools this year, still very interested in mixotrophs and their evolution. And he wrote one of the, the strongest GRFP proposals that I've ever seen. So uh, if he applies to your lab, please give him really serious consideration. 
Um, so when Logan was working with us at UC Santa Barbara, he developed this really fascinating mathematical model to understand mixotroph thermal evolution. And in doing this, Logan had to wrestle with how we constrain the extent to which mixotrophs invest in phototrophy by building chloroplasts or invest in phagotrophy by building digestive vacuoles. And as we've discussed before as part of this working group, fundamentally we imagine that mixotrophs experience some kind of trade-off between these two forms of metabolism because both require carbon investments, both require physical space in the cytoplasm. But the challenge is that the shape of that trade-off function is not well constrained. Um, so Logan was able, because he was using mathematical models, to explore a gradient of different possibilities, including a linear trade-off where a mixotroph has sort of a one-to-one -one exchange in which it can uh, reduce investment in phototrophy and increase investment in phagotrophy, or in purple, a generalist mixotroph, which is a mixotroph that can simultaneously invest in photosynthesis and phagotrophy and simultaneously maintain relatively high rates of those two forms of metabolism or a specialist mixotroph that has to give up a lot of photosynthesis to increase phagotrophy and vice versa. In working with this model, Logan was able to apply a mathematical framework called adaptive dynamics. And what adaptive dynamics does is it asks, what's the best evolutionary strategy that a mixotroph could adopt? In particular, what's the strategy in terms of investment in phototrophy versus phagotrophy that could not be invaded or taken over or outcompeted by another mixotroph that has a slightly different strategy? And so what we can do is look at Logan's results as a function of environmental temperature. So here on the y-axis, we're looking at that evolutionarily stable strategy of the mixotroph. A zero means that that mixotroph is entirely photosynthetic, and a one means that that mixotroph is putting 100% of its investment in phagotrophy, so it's entirely heterotrophic. And what we see is that across all three types of trade-off functions that Logan explored, these mixotrophs are generally evolving to become more heterotrophic as temperatures warm. Now, it's one thing to sort of confirm that uh, evolution will sort of double down on this predicted phenotypically plastic response, so increased investment in, in heterotrophy and phagotrophy as the more metabolically favorable reaction when temperatures warm. It's one thing to explore that mathematically. It's another thing to actually be able to demonstrate this empirically. And so Michelle lapori Bui, an NSF graduate fellow, former master's student in our group, decided to test the model's predictions by performing a long-term evolution experiment. So what she did was take two marine members of the genus Ochromonas and incubate them at different temperatures for hundreds of generations. So this is enough time to allow these mixotrophs to accumulate evolutionary change. And once we've done this evolution experiment, and Michelle's recent paper reports in the first uh, three years of that evolution experiment, but it's still ongoing. I think we're approaching close to year five now in our group. Um, once you've evolved these lineages, then you can assay them as a function of temperature and understand how their phenotypic plasticity has been shaped by evolution. So for example, we can take our control evolution. This is the mixotroph that's been evolving at 24 degrees Celsius, which is the ancestral temperature. And we can assay it at three different temperatures. It's, it's current temperature, the cold temperature, and the hot temperature. And we can contrast that performance with the cold evolved, ancestor, the cold evolved lineage in blue and the hot evolved lineage in red. Now, as you can imagine, when we do these phenotypic uh, plasticity assays and these reciprocal transplants, we generate massive amounts of data. Um, but today, I want to focus in on two key comparisons. So the first of these is going to be the comparison between the lineage that's been evolving at cold temperatures contrasted with the control evolution assayed at the cold temperature. So essentially, what we're doing here is we're contrasting the evolved response with the phenotypically plastic response. And we'll do that at both cold temperatures and at hot temperatures by contrasting the hot evolved lineage to the control evolution at hot temperatures. Now, when we make these comparisons, what we're able to do is, for example, look for evidence of evolutionary adaptation. So what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is the number of evolutionary generations. So essentially the length of evolutionary time that these cultures have had at their new temperatures. And then the y-axis is the difference in growth rate between the evolved lineage and the lineage evolved at the ancestral temperature. So here positive numbers mean that with evolutionary time, these mixotrophs have gotten better at growing at either colder or hotter temperatures. 
What we can see in both cold temperatures in blue and hot temperatures in red is that within 50 or even 100 generations, these mixotrophs have mounted an adaptive evolutionary response. So they've figured it out. They've gotten better at growing in their new temperatures compared to what they would have been able to do with just a short-term acclimation in terms of a phenotypically plastic response. Now, how is it that mixotrophs have, have gotten better at growth? How have they increased their growth rates? Is it through increased phototrophy or increased phagotrophy, a combination of the two? Well, Michelle assayed this and contrasted the rates of photosynthesis and the rates of grazing in these mixotroph cultures. And what she found was that, interestingly, both evolved lineages did less photosynthesis than the lineage evolved at the control temperature. But intriguingly, the lineages evolved at hot temperatures had done even more heterotrophy, so they, even more phagotrophy. So their grazing rates were elevated compared to the phenotypically plastic response of a mixotroph that was just briefly brought to the hotter temperatures. So this sort of confirms Logan's mathematical modeling results that argue that these mixotrophs should become more phagotrophic at hotter temperatures and that evolution would compound this because the mixotrophs will be more evolutionarily efficient and, and more fit with a greater investment in phagotrophy. Now, this is a bit of a, a disturbing result when we think about connecting mixotrophs to the global carbon cycle because it suggests that evolution could exacerbate a positive climate feedback loop. In particular, warmer temperatures should lead potentially to more heterotrophy and therefore increased phagotrophy. And our evolution models and our evolution experiments seem to suggest that evolution will accelerate this even further, will compound this outcome even further. And this increased phagotrophy, of course, then leads to increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide content and therefore even further warming of Earth's surface ocean temperatures, which would, of course, accelerate this positive feedback loop. And because as Earth's uh, surface ocean gets warmer and more stratified, we expect mixotrophs to become even more dominant. That suggests even further wrinkles that could accelerate mixotroph contributions to carbon dioxide uh, accumulation in Earth's atmosphere. But look, for me here in California, it's only 8.20 in the morning, and I'm only halfway through this talk, so this is a far too depressing uh, conclusion to draw at this juncture. So I want to put some caveats on it, namely that in Michelle's work, she found that this was the case only for a subset of her evolution experiments. So only in one of her uh, evolved strains of the two that she contrasted, and even then only in the highest light levels, did she find strong evidence for this evolutionary compounding of phagotrophy. So this is both a a good thing and a bad thing, right? On the one hand, it's reassuring to know that not all mixotrophs are going to have this evolutionary response that compounds their investment in phagotrophy, but it's also challenging because how do we figure out which mixotrophs are going to exhibit which type of response so that we can make realistic predictions for the future ocean? I'm not sure of the answer of that, but I think in looking back at some of Logan's mathematical modeling results, we have a clue, and that is that we need to understand the mixotrophs trade-offs that uh, determine how much they can invest in phototrophy versus phagotrophy. So when we first looked at this key result from Logan's modeling work, we focused on the uh, observation that all three mixotroph trade-off functions led to an increase in phagotrophy with temperature. But note that the extent of this increase depended on the mixotroph's trade-off function. So for example, if we look at the generalist mixotroph in purple, we can see that while it does evolve higher rates of phagotrophy at warmer temperatures, this is a much more muted response than a mixotroph with a linear or a specialist trade-off function. So if we can understand the underlying trade-offs that mixotrophs are experiencing, maybe we can get better at predicting which type of mixotroph uh, will evolve in response or which types of mixotrophs are going to have the strongest evolutionary responses. Now, as I mentioned when we were talking about Logan's work, one challenge is that we just don't have a lot of data on the types of trade-offs that mixotrophs experience. But fortunately, another fantastic undergraduate researcher in our lab, Gina Barbalia, has decided to take on this challenge. So what Gina has done is to take eight different marine ochromona strains and grow them in different bacterial abundances, so both low prey and high prey conditions, and then across a gradient of six different light levels. So in other words, she's manipulating the resource environment for these mixotrophs, which is allowing us to push their phenotypically plastic responses and assay how flexible they can be in photosynthesis and phagotrophic investment and look at trade-offs between those two forms of metabolism. 
So for example, with Gina's data, we're able to test hypotheses like the more phagotrophic a mixotroph is, the less photosynthetic it should be. And in Gina's data, we find indeed that that hypothesis is confirmed. So when we grow mixotrophs in high bacterial environments where they have abundant food, and indeed we measure them as eating more, so having higher rates of phagotrophy, they also have lower chlorophyll content, so lower chlorophyll per carbon content and lower rates of photosynthesis. However, this sort of coarse-grained evidence for trade-offs doesn't get us at what type of uh, trade-off shape these mixotrophs likely exhibit. So to do this, what we need is to examine our entire data set. So here I'm showing you the data for one of the eight strains of Ochromonas. I'm showing you on the x-axis that organism's investment in phototrophy, so chlorophyll per carbon, and on the y-axis, its investment in phagotrophy. Now, as many of you are well aware, it's challenging to quantify phagotrophy in these organisms. Here we're using attack rate as a proxy because we think that the, organ the mixotroph's attack rate is probably a good proxy for how much investment it's making in a phagotrophic form of metabolism. Now, when you look at this graph, what you see is that these points certainly don't fall along a line or even a curve, but they do all sort of fall in this lower uh, triangular region of the graph. The points are also color coded. So the brighter white a point is, the slower the growth rate of the mixotroph in those environmental conditions. And what I think we're observing here is the emergence of this sort of low growth rate edge closer to that diagonal trade-off line, which I think is a, what we would term a Pareto frontier, so a trade-off that only emerges when other constraints are alleviated. So in particular, I think that we're seeing this trade-off emerge when the mixotroph growth rates are lowest because that's where the mixotroph is resource limited. So it needs to sort of maximize its investments in phototrophy and phagotrophy to try to gain as much carbon and nutrients as it possibly can to uh, stimulate its growth. When growth rates are higher, however, closer to the origin with these darker points, these mixotrophs are probably not so resource limited. They might be limited by something else. And borrowing language from dynamic energy budget theory and from a really nice paper by Clark and colleagues in limnology and oceanography, we might think of this other limiting factor as some type of physical structure inside the cell that that cell is using to, say, copy DNA, uh, manufacture other material inside the cell. And so um, when growth rate is low is when we're going to push up against this Pareto frontier and really observe the trade-off between investment in chlorophyll versus investment in digestive vacuoles. Okay, so that's one of our mixotrophs, but Gina assayed eight, and here I'm showing you four of those. They're representative of the, the four other ones. And you can see that in two cases, okay, you know, we see some evidence of this Pareto frontier at low growth rates, but in the other two cases, it's not clear what's going on, right? There's certainly, even when you look at the brightest white low growth rate points, no evidence of, of a trade-off. So I think in this case, what we're seeing is that for the mixotrophs with the blue arrows, these might be organisms that have inherently a more flexible investment strategy. Whereas in red with the question marks, these might be mixotrophs that perhaps for some reason have a more fixed investment strategy. Maybe there's some underlying rules that constrain the coupling of investment in chlorophyll and investment in chloroplasts to their investment in digestive vacuoles and investment in phagotrophy. And this is where I think what we're about to hear from Lily is incredibly important because I think that it's probably the original, the evolutionary origins of how those chloroplasts were incorporated into the mixotrophs that sets up whether a mixotroph is going to have a fixed investment strategy or be more metabolically flexible. So if we can understand more about the evolutionary origins and the evolutionary gains of plastids, we might be better able to constrain and predict mixotroph evolution. So to summarize, I think it's incredibly important to understand mixotrophic evolution <clears throat> to understand how mixotrophs are going to influence Earth's climate system in future. But to do this, we have to understand their past evolutionary history to get at their underlying trade-offs and constraints. By coupling this understanding of evolutionary history and identification of mixotroph traits with some additional evolution experiments, I think we can get better predictions for how mixotrophs may adapt or fail to adapt to future climate conditions and ultimately make better predictions of climate feedbacks. 
So I'm going to stop there and we'll take a, a couple minutes for questions and then move on to Lily's talk. So any uh, questions about this part of our session today? And I'm realizing that one challenge with WebEx is that I'm not sure how to moderate. So if one of the co-hosts could let me know if there are any questions in the chat or anyone with their hands raised, that would be fantastic. I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Oh, Susanna, I think you have a hand up. Thanks for the talk, Holly. It's really uh, impressive. I have many questions, but I'm just gonna start by one. Uh, and that is that you use attack rate as a proxy for investment of Fargo Trophy, right? Yeah. I'm wondering how exactly does that look like? Do you control for uh, prey availability in some way? Uh, so um, technically we make the measurement using fluorescently labeled bacteria. So we um, do an amendment with different concentrations of fluorescently labeled bacteria and create a grazing curve as a function of different um, prey concentrations and then the attack rate is the slope of that so oh, yes, a full function of response yeah exactly um but indeed these mixotrophs are growing in so um the only manipulation of prey availability in their home culture is with the low and high bacterial treatment so we're not i think one limitation of gina's study is that we have a gradient of light environments but only a binary high low prey availability um, and so we're probably missing some subtlety there. And then if I may follow up on that, I was wondering how that would impact the evolution experiment because there probably prey availability would influence the evolution towards heterotrophy, right? Absolutely, yes. And uh, we, so when Michelle conducted her experiment, she did it in what Gina would term low prey availability conditions. So it turned out that um, it was really challenging to try to maintain the evolution experiment for more than 50 or so generations azenically without prey, um, just because, as you know well, the cultures can be more volatile and um, and also subject to contamination. So Michelle ran a xenic experiment. So there's coevolution, presumably, between bacteria and the mixotrophs. Uh, we have subsequently begun an experiment where we're growing the mixotrophs with additional prey, so in a high prey environment. And I have to say that we don't see nearly as strong evidence for adaptation in that experiment, which was interesting to me because I would have predicted if I could accelerate their growth rates, I'd accelerate evolution, everything would sort of run faster. Um, I think my hunch is that underlying that is that additional prey availability supports more phenotypic plasticity. We need to do more work to understand that, but I think that could alleviate some of the selection pressure um, and uh, therefore reduce the evolutionary signal that we're seeing. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm going to take down my screen share here so that we can see. Um, all right, so Elizabeth Lilly, have you? Yes, I managed. <laughs> Can Excellent. You yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Uh, wonderful. Okay, then I will uh, start my screen share. I'm really okay. sorry. I haven't really no, heard. No, not at all. So while, while you're pulling that up, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, <laughs> okay. So Good. I am, and I am super thrilled that uh, Lily's wrestled with all these technological challenges to join us today. So I first met Dr. Elizabeth Hattenberger when we were at UBC, University of British Columbia together, and she was working with uh, in Patrick Keeling's lab to understand the evolution of plastids. Uh, from there, she went on to postdoc with Alex Warden at Ambari and, and later when Alex moved to GMR in Germany. And she is currently a Lumina Carenter Fellow in the Czech Republic at the Biology Center at the Institute of Parasitology. She's doing really incredible uh, work using bioinformatic and molecular tools. And today, Lily is going to talk to us about some absolutely fantastic work uh, using molecular tools to understand the evolutionary origins of mixotrophy, and especially by trying to disentangle how the heck these chloroplasts are moving around in between uh, different organisms and how they are gained and, and the influence of that on their new host. 
Um, so Lily, your screen share looks great. We can see your talk, so I'll let you take it Thanks away. Everyone. Thanks for joining That's us. Something. Yeah, well, thank you for this, um, yeah, really nice introduction. So yeah, I don't have to say a lot about myself anymore. Um, so yeah, my name is Elizabeth Hemberger, and yeah, I recently took up this position in the Czech Republic. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, work I did uh, still with Patrick Keeling as a postdoc, but I, as you will see in the end, I'm still uh, working on this group of dinoflagellates I'm going to talk about today. And uh, today I'm going to talk about this very, for me, very intriguing organism, the Rossi dinoflagellate, which I think uh, is on the way from being a non-constitutive to being a constitutive mixotroph, but I also have to say right from the start that I'm uh, my background is very much plastid evolution and uh, not mixotrophy, so I'm quite excited to hear your thoughts afterwards in the uh, discussion groups about what I'm presenting today. So I want to start uh, a little bit uh, more generally uh, with plastid evolution. So in this uh, tree of eukaryotes, I try to highlight all the lineages that uh, possess a plastid but are not necessarily uh, photosynthetic with the color green, uh, just to uh, show you the distribution of plastid across uh, eukaryotes. And it's pretty well agreed upon that plastid evolution started with the uptake of a cyanobacterium by eukaryote in a process called a primary um, endosymbiosis or primary plastid endosymbiosis. And this gave rise uh, to a group of lineages that we now uh, collectively call the archaeplastids. And from there, this uh, primary plastid has uh, spread from um, red algae and also from green algae that are within this group across um, uh, the tree of eukaryotes in so-called secondary endosymbiotic or higher order um, endosymbiotic events. And this uh, gave rise then to the picture we see today with uh, plastids across almost all groups of eukaryotes. How this distribution has hap happened, we don't really know, and is actually uh, quite contentious. And what we also don't really know what happens uh, in the time frame or in the time span between the uptake um, of an endosymbiont and then the actually establishment of a stable plastid. The uh, primary plastid lineages are uh, um, very uh, difficult to use uh, for such studies of plastid evolution because this event of primary endosymbiosis has happened such a long time ago, probably more than 1.5 billion years. But there are lots of other lineages uh, with higher order plastid endosymbiosis where this um, yeah, endosymbiotic event has taken place much later. And those are the ones I'm interested in especially um, a group of organisms uh, inside here within the alveolates, and those are the dinoflagellates. Very briefly, I want to make a tiny little detour uh, from dinoflagellates specifically, because they are closely related, those are the dinoflagellates here, uh, to the AP complexins, uh, to most of us known as parasites, but comparative studies between those two groups have shown us that the ancestor of these, uh, and probably also the ancestor of dinoflagellates, was uh, likely a mixotroph, so the ancestral state of dinoflagellates was uh, mixotrophy, which, yeah, I think I should mention in context of this uh, presentation. But now coming back, uh, or really going to the dinoflagellates specifically, and why they're so interesting in terms of plastid evolution, because they have a super uh, complex and dynamic plastid evolution. If you look at this uh, tree figure here, which is uh, showing more or less the same lineages uh, in the slide before, just graying out everything that's not dinoflagellates, um, you can see here that um, uh, the different colors in the dinoflagellates are showing uh, the different plastids in the dinoflagellates, which are quite a few. Uh, the main plastid in dinoflagellates, or the one that we call the typical dinoflagellate plastid, is here shown in brown, the um, peridinine plastid, which has lost in several cases uh, the ability to photosynthesize, which is shown in black, or was completely lost. Uh, but in many cases, this plastid was also replaced either uh, with transient kleptoplast, kleptoplasts indicated in red, or with uh, new plastids that have been uh, stably integrated and are vertically inherited. And one of the uh, families I want to highlight here are the Carinia Sea with uh, stably integrated haptophyte plastids, because those are the ones I'm going to talk about uh, the rest of the talk. And 
Um, after showing you this figure, you would think dinoflagellates are the perfect uh, group to study plastid evolution. However, they have two big drawbacks. Uh, when you study dinoflagellates, because they have on one hand massive genomes, they can be uh, bigger than 200 gigabases. And another drawback that's not just specific to dinoflagellate is that many species are really difficult to culture, and, this, and that's why many are not cultured, especially the ones I'm interested in, like kleptoplastidic lineages that obtain um, the plastids from their prey. There are some people that manage to culture those, and uh, one of those uh, is Becky Gast, who actually managed to culture the main player of the talk, um, the Rossi dinoflagellate. Um, on an expedition to the Rossi in Antarctica, which is shown here, the Rossi, um, they found that a single SSU dominated their samples, and this SSU belonged to a dinoflagellate which is actually related to this family of dinoflagellates, the Crinaceae, with stably integrated haptophat plastids. And not surprisingly, uh, this um, our, uh, dinoflagellate that they termed Rossi dinoflagellate or RSD also has plastids that are closely related to a haptophyte, Theocystis antarctica. However, when establishing cultures and performing experiments, they found out that um, RSD, RSD possesses kleptoplasts that it obtains from specifically feeding on Theocystis antarctica, so not stably integrated plastids. And uh, I think in terms of mixotrophic classification, you would call this then a plastidic specialist non-constitutive mixotroph, which I mostly wrote down for myself to remember it. And they also learned that uh, RSD can only grow in the light and that it retains the plastids uh, and can survive without prey unusually long, at least in comparison to all other kleptoplastidic lineages uh, that uh, we know so far, uh, which uh, suggests a very um, yeah, close relationship between the two partners. I was uh, very excited uh, to be able to work then on this lineage because it gave me um, a yeah, very unique system to study in the symbiosis because it was the first time that we had um, dinoflagellates or lineages with a range of plastid integration levels, so RSD with kleptoplasts that are not fully integrated, and other related lineages like Carinia and Calodinium with stably integrated plastids um, that yeah, are actually closely related and that we can compare to each other. And one of the questions that we actually tried with this unique system that we tried to answer is what actually happens in this time uh, during a plastic uptake and plastic establishment and in which order are these events happening. Um, there is uh, two models I briefly want to introduce that are around in our field and the one tr more traditional view is that first an um, endosymbiont is being taken up somehow it's not being digested and then at some point it's being genetically integrated by gene transfer from the endosymbiont endosymbiont to the host that is then targeted back to the endosymbiont and that's what we call targeting late hypothesis. But more uh, recently uh, another model uh, was proposed and that uh, proposes that um, during uh, evolution of the endosymbiont there's probably more than one association, there are several transi transient associations and these associations uh, leave traces by gene transfer um, into the host nucleus and these gene transfers are also targeted back but uh, this um, uh, endosymbiont can be still digested so this transfer can happen before the final plastid um, has been established and as a result we should also see um, in the host uh, nucleus uh, gene transfers from uh, various different endosymbionts. So to investigate uh, this hypothesis with this uh, unique system I got now by using RSD, uh, I used several approaches and uh, what we did first is like basically going for the low hanging fruit. We looked at known plastid associated proteins, like everything associated with photosynthesis, but also non-photosynthetic metabolic pathways in uh, um, um, that are targeted to the plastid in RSD to see if there are nuclear encoded um, genes that are targeted to a plastid in RSD. And we would have expected to find um, yeah, pathways um, and proteins targeted to the kleptoplast. 
so we looked what uh, is the ori origin of these proteins phylogenetically and where are they located. So are they actually targeted to a plastid? And we compared RSD with the other Carinia C we had data for, which were Carinia and Calodinium and also other dinoflagellates. But I'm not showing those here because this picture is already horribly enough and I'm really sorry when I'm showing this, but I'm trying to walk you through this because the alternative are yeah, looking at tons of trees. So in the rows here, you can see three different uh, pathways, uh, plastidial metabolic pathways, isoprenoid, heme, and the iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis pathways. And the columns represent the RSD, uh, Carinia, and the calodinium dinoflagellates. And they're subdivided into the sources of uh, the proteins, dinoflagellate, haptophyte, or other sources. And the two take home messages from this figure are, First, you can see a lot of yellow in RSD, meaning that the plastidial proteins in RSD are actually targeted still to the ancestral dinoflagellar plastid. So despite having kleptoplasts, um, RSD retained its ancestral plastid. However, it's likely not photosynthetic. And the other thing that was quite interesting for us that all three dinoflagellates um, have um, proteins that are from other sources than the dinoflagellate or the current plastid. So there are proteins that are not from haptophytes. And this uh, yeah, suggests that this theory that there are various association with um, different transient endosymbionts happening um, in the Carinacea might be actually true. Uh, studying only specific pathways, however, did not give us a good overview of uh, general haptophyte gene transfers in the Rossi dinoflagellates. So we screened uh, not just a few pathways, but all proteins of uh, this dinoflagellate that uh, were annotated uh, for association with haptophytes, meaning uh, all proteins that are very theoretically uh, transferred from an haptophyte endosymbiont that could be the actual kleptoplast or a former association. So we looked, does the protein have haptophyte origins? Does it cluster with haptophytes in the tree? And we also checked uh, whether the protein is actually really encoded in the dinoflagellate nucleus, so in the RSD nucleus, because when um, creating the data for RSD, um, Becky was not able to completely separate the dinoflagellate Flagellates from its prey, so we always had to make sure we are, yeah, separate um, our information from contamination. And what we found when we looked at more than 1500 trees were actually only three uh, gene transfers from haptophytes, these are the ones shown here, uh, to the RSD nucleus that we are quite sure about. They are coming from haptophytes and are now encoded in the dinoflagellate nucleus. What's interesting to us that only one here, the first one, is probably from the current kleptoplast. All the others are probably from previous associations with haptophytes. And the most uh, exciting thing for us that many of those gene transfers are also present in the other Carinia C, which suggests quite strongly um, that uh, gene transfer and retargeting to the plastid was probably already present in the ancestor of these three dinoflagellates, so before the current plastid was established, which is different. RSD has a kleptoplast and Carinia and Calodinium likely have uh, plastids from two different haptophytes. So this was basically the first time we had evidence for this uh, model of um, uh, transfer early or targeting early. And the last thing we did was also to look for the function of these uh, gene transfers that are targeted to the haptophyte kleptoplast in RSD to see if RSD has some kind of control of this plastid. And what we found that uh, four transfers that uh, resulted in three distinct genes uh, were actually involved in photosynthesis. And the gene products of these are these three uh, shown here in orange in a reconstruction of the photosynthetic electron transport chain in the RST kleptoplast. And it was uh, quite neat to see that the same uh, three proteins, also nucleus encoded in the free living haptophyte prey. Um, and uh, when uh, we actually found another protein that uh, 
is also a chain transfer, although from an unknown source so far. We uh, speculated that actually RSD would be able to perform, the RSD kleptoplasts are able to perform a cyclic electron transport. So using these three chain transfers, RSD uh, was able to control photosynthesis, uh, although only in a restricted way. Uh, and this um, idea was also supported by the finding of Becky Gast's lab that the um, uh, activity of photosystem 2 uh, is severely diminished in RSD kleptoplasts. So to summarize our finding and also maybe speculate a little bit about the future research, uh, yeah, so the um, uh, yeah, identification of RSD and um, it, its comparison with its relatives, with haptophyplastids, uh, yeah, provided us for the first time uh, with um, evidence for the targeting early hypothesis. And it seems that at least in RSD, uh, only a handful of gene transfers is necessary to obtain uh, uh, control over the most important function of the kleptoplast, which is photosynthesis, because the other plastid functions, for the other plastid function, RSD still retains his, its ancestral peridinine plastid. And what was also quite curious for me that the Carinacea um, had a previous association with various lineages, so not just with haptophytes, but for example, also with stromino, mainly with stromenopiles, but also bacteria and green algae. And although we cannot say if this was maybe just food, uh, we also cannot exclude the possibilities that those might have been endosymbiotic associations, suggesting that the Carinacea are really versatile in, uh, yeah, their plastidic partners. And I think this becomes even more interesting just in the end now um, to um, yeah, point this out when looking at novel lineages that were found in the Carinaceae. One of them is Shimiella, which is, seems closely related to the Rossi dinoflagellate uh, based on 18S phylogenies. Uh, however, Shimiella, which uh, is also kleptoplastidic, it retains not haptophyte, but cryptophyte kleptoplasts, which was quite surprising for me because I couldn't find any cryptophyte um, traces in any of the three dinoflagellates in the Carinaceae I have studied so far. So maybe this is a new thing for this family. And the other thing is uh, Gershia, which is the first um, Carinaceae dinoflagellate that uh, has the ancestral peridinine plastid. However, we don't know if it retained the ancestral plastid and never had uh, a different plastid because it is embedded within the uh, uh, other plastids that all have replaced the plastid in some form. So it might have uh, been mixotrophic at some point and went back to being purely phototrophic. Overall, this family is like extremely versatile in plastid evolution and also in their mixotrophic behavior. And for me, in the future, it will be interesting if this is something, yeah, if this is maybe just a fluke of this um, a family of dinoflagellates or if we find this in other dinoflagellates and also in other mixotrophic lineages. So in the end, um, I yeah want to thank, of course, first and foremost, uh, Becky Gast uh, to give me yeah the opportunity to work on this dinoflagellate and also my former supervisor, Patrick. And also I uh, want to thank my um, collaborators in Japan and Korea that yeah are so um, gracious to uh, share their um, cultures and um, data with me from uh, the new Carinia Sea lineages, for which I'm very grateful. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Oh, this stuff is remains so fascinating and so complex and fun. Confusing. <laughs> <laughs> In all the best ways. Um, we have a few minutes now for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or unmute and chat them out or type them into the chat. Okay, there's Susanne. No one else has a question, at least. I have plenty again. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. It was a very interesting talk. Um, 
you mentioned that those three genes that you found to be transferred were all involved in cyclic electron transport. Mm -hmm. And for me, that triggered immediately the question, if they have a relatively low activity of photosystem two, do they then still fix a lot of carbon because linear electron transport would be needed for that? And mm -hmm. that is, of course, assumed to be the major product that would be exchanged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's true. And the other thing is, I totally didn't mention that we are not even sure if there might be still a nucleus from um, the haptophyte inside the cell. So there might be actually additional control from the haptophyte nucleus of the kleptoplast, but at least according to the activity of photosystem 2, it doesn't seem to be the case. So I don't know what the nucleus is doing in there, but it yeah doesn't seem to fully allow yeah to like photosynthesis to take place in its normal you know conditions. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it would be super interesting to follow up on the physiology and like what, yeah. how they're actually regulating the photosynthesis and how much carbon is exchanged. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I think that, uh, Johan Dissel is actually working on RSD. So I think he might answer this question partially. I'm the 1 person who has never seen RSD live <laughs> in culture. So I'm just working with the data. So I'm probably also not the right 1 to ask, but yeah, you're right. That, that's. That's like 1 of the yeah, really cool questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So. Excellent. Well, so for those of you who are with us for the first time as part of this working group, um, typically in these sessions, we have a couple talks to get our, our minds stimulated on a particular topic. And then from like, there we, oh, sorry, uh, Matt, Matt has a question. He raised his hand. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. I yeah, see you there, I Matt. See sorry. That. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, thanks. Oh, um, Hi. <laughs> I, had a, <laughs> I had a question for Elizabeth. Um, do you think it's possible to think about um, in the case of these uh, Karenaceae, um, Karenaceae, I guess, um, down to flagellates that they actually might replace their plastids um, or acquire, uh, begin acquiring new plastids before they actually lose their old ones. So, like, maybe they still have a vestigial peridinum plastid or haptophyte plastid in some cases. Um, and they're actually start beginning um, kleptoplasticity and beginning possibly um, a new transition or dedicating themselves to a new type of plastic because the old plastic was say on its way out, but not fully lost. Like, do you really think they go fully heterotrophic and lose everything before they start reacquiring the plastids in this particular lineage? Well, in this particular lineage, I don't know, but there are many heterotrophic dinoflagell lineages that still have the plastids, just not photosynthetic anymore. That's not unusual at all. So they don't seem to leave. It seems to be hard for them to lose the whole plastid. So they retain, especially the non photosynthetic functions that. But there is at least data wise, I've never looked at such a lineage in the Carinia sea. And I'm not sure if I'm. Saying something wrong here, but I think there is no Carinaceae lineage known that doesn't do photosynthesis at all. So either with a stable or kleptoplast plastic. So in this specific case, I can't say. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they're always I'm I'm almost sure that either either even the Carinaceae with that seemingly have replaced the plastic still retain the peritoneum plastic. I see so many traces of it, and I don't know why they would keep those proteins around and would keep targeting it to a plastic that's not there anymore. So, Is there good ultrastructural evidence that it's still there, like a leucoplast? Okay. No one has ever seen a non photosynthetic plastic in dinoflagellates. People have been looking. That's what I thought. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, Thanks. there are ideas that it probably looks pretty weird by now and doesn't look like a plastic anymore. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. Thanks for the great question. Sorry, I missed your hand there, Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, <great>. so. <laughs>
Uh, so we'll go from here into small group discussion now that we have so much evolution on our minds. So I've just pasted into the chat a link to a Google document where you'll see some discussion prompts and then spaces for note taking for our uh, breakout sessions. So uh, in a couple of seconds here, we'll open the breakout rooms and we ask that you pick one of these topics or several, or maybe your conversation goes in a different direction, but that you designate a reporter because we'll come back at quarter past the hour to debrief together what we've discussed. Um, so have a little under 20 minutes in these breakout rooms um, that we can go ahead and open. Holly. This is Jessica. Um, I think we have five groups um, arranged and I was just wondering, uh, so we have, uh, because Nicole is leaving, we have Sus Susanna leading one, Matt leading one, and then maybe we need another, maybe Suzanne Wilkin might be willing to. I think, um, I can know that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So. I think, uh, yeah, breakout rooms are open. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Jessica. Welcome back, everyone. I think we've got most folks back in the room. Good to see you all. Um, so let's debrief a little bit. It'd be nice to hear a synopsis of, of the conversations. I think in the end, um, we had three breakout rooms, one, two, and five. So. Would someone from, we'll go in order, would someone from breakout room one like to summarize your discussion? Or if you want to take a second to get organized, we can start with breakout room two. I think we were breakout group one. Um, we, 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 we tackled question number two. Um, and if anyone wants to step in at any time, uh, please, you know, please feel free. We sort of, um, you know, we, we talked about um, a little bit about the confusion of the terminology, you know, of course, in Mixotrophy, that's, um, that's always a constant gripe. Um, but, you know, we focused a lot on um, the uh, power of using omics tools to some extent, at least um, how it's currently underway in dinoflagellates and some ciliates to, especially to look at non-constituent mixotrophs to help tease apart um, uh, sort of where they are and their dependence on photosynthesis and, and phagotrophy and that sort of thing. Um, and, and how traditionally and, and, and currently studies have focused on when, you know, what conditions select for mixotrophic activity and um, whether or not cells are um, obligate mixotrophs or facultative mixotrophs is important to quantify that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we, um, I, we we were sort of caught in mid discussion and didn't really come to any strong conclusions before our time was up. I'm afraid. Um, um, does anyone else from the group have anything else to add to that brief synopsis? I think that pretty much covers it. <laughs> but um, in particular, I just think it's really interesting. You know, there's. So much variability, especially in non constitutive mixotrophs, in terms of, you know, what mixotrophy looks like uh, within that group. So I feel like that's also something that we talked about a bit. Again, no clear conclusions. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Breakout Room One. Uh, room Two, what was your discussion like over there? Oh, I can report. So in, in room two, we had Elizabeth and Suzanne Wilkin, George, um, and myself. And I need to confess that we also discussed mostly in number two, question number two. <laughs> um, so yeah, after Elizabeth's talk, we were like, oh my God, maybe we need to revisit the functional classification, right? Like we can't really put the rusty dinoflagellate in what we have now. But then we discuss that it's important to have this functional classification because it really helped us to, under to better understand the ecological impacts of mixotrophs. They have very different strategies. And if we want to model them, um, it's kind of hard to put all of them in a box. Um, but it's still maybe the boxes that we have now, they exclude some organisms. 
Um, so we reflected a little bit about how widespread RSD um, can be, like among other species in the ocean, are, um, how uh, dominant is this kind of strategy, and is it relevant numerically that we should be modeling as a separate group or thinking more about this type of strategy. Um, and at the same time that we don't have a conclusion here, we kind of discussed that for these non-constitutive mixotrophs, um, we know a little bit about the traits that can matter. And we discussed how we can look at it from the perspective of the acquired plastid, right? Like the type of plastids that they use um, and also um, how they control it. So perhaps like thinking what this plastid is providing to the mixotroph in terms of resources, how long they can keep it, um, uh, what type of places they acquire, it can be like um, informative and, and help us to move forward. Um, and also trying to discover like, what is the fate of these plastids? Are they being digested? Are they being adjusted from the cell? This information could help us um, to better model these organisms. Um, uh, and I think that was mostly what we discussed, but I will open for the group to remind me if I forgot anything. Um... No, I think I think that covered most of it. We did talk in the end a little bit about the, the fully heterotrophic dinos and what's their history of plastid uh, retention. And, and uh, we came to the conclusion that it, it or, or uh, Elizabeth mentioned that, you know, basically it seems they can lose chloroplasts over time and then reacquire them later. You know, that, that, that might be a thing that within a given lineage is, is uh, over evolutionary time uh, changeable. So they're heterotrophs right now, but stick around, they might change. Yeah. So maybe you just have to make a separate group for dinoflagellates when you classify. They're just especially annoying. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to argue with that, although, you know, ciliates, pretty soon Matt and I are going to be arguing to give ciliates their own special annoying box and or 15 boxes. So. Um, all right, breakout group five. All right, so I'm reporting from breakout room five um, where we had Isat, Naya, um, myself and Holly. Um, and so non, not surprisingly, we all also focused on question number two. Uh, <laughs> um, we had uh, Anaya in our group um, who worked on RSD, um, who's interested in asking you know, more questions about within cell carbon cycle and morphological changes. Um, in terms of you know, thinking about the classification, we had a little discussion on, you know, when is it important to um, get to um, to further split the uh, classifications of mixotrophs? And certainly, from a physiological perspective and studying evolution, we absolutely need these intermediate groups. Um, it's kind of a question as to you know when you would need these further classifications for modeling, um, but we didn't talk about that too much. Um, within our group, we kind of talked about specifically retention, um, retention of plastids in terms of mechanisms. Um, and this appeared to be one of the biggest questions um, that our group uh, focused on is both, you know, time, um, how long the retention time was, and also, um, also the, the um, retention period um, and how environmental conditions um, impact um, impact retention. Um, let's see, was there anything else that we, oh, and then um, specifically which, what type of organelle uh, and what type of plastic, plastic was retained. Um, but yeah, this is what we mostly focused on. Um, Holly, is there anything else you'd like to add? That was a great summary. Thanks, Jessica. All right, I think that covered all the breakout rooms. Is there anything that came up for you in discussion or in hearing those synopses that we haven't had a chance to chat about here yet? Okay. 
Well, with that, I want to thank uh, Lily and, and all of our Europeans who've signed on today, especially for your time this late in the day. And thank you all for coming. Um, the Mixotrophs and Mixotrophy Working Group is going to continue to hold these bi-monthly or, well, every two months um, webinars. So if you have a topic that you'd like us to tackle or, or to uh, have as one of our themes in, in January, March, and so on in, in 2023, please do get in touch with a member of the leadership team or really any member of our working group and stay tuned to our OCB website and keep an eye on announcements on Twitter, such as Twitter exists in two months, uh, and via email about uh, future uh, working group sessions.